Welcome to a brand new edition of Problematic Women, a podcast that empowers right-minded women. I'm Lauren Evans, and we have so much to unpack for you today. First, we have Heritage President Kay Coles-James on the program to talk about the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the commission President Trump appointed her on to celebrate this occasion. Then we discuss, can the left get any more extreme on abortion? And finally, has the Me Too movement actually made things more difficult for women in the workplace? To help me break down everything, I have my partner in crime and Problematic Women co-host Kelsey Bowler in the studio with me. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, if you are a Problematic Woman yourself, or if you support strong, right-minded women, please support the show by leaving a five-star review on iTunes and encouraging your friends to subscribe. How many women today even know what the word suffrage means? We hit the streets to find out. How long is this going to go on? Ladies, unite against suffrage. End the suffraging now. We're trying to stop the suffrage um, and the suffrage of women in this country. Sir, I would be happy to sign. Thank you very much. You saved the dolphins. Now let's stop the suffrage. I do this for personal reasons. My mother, um, two of my aunts, and my sister are all suffered last year. Tell me what the 19th Amendment is. The 19th Amendment is very unjust. That was comedian Jimmy Kimmel back when he was hosting a very problematic The Man Show in a sketch where he filmed himself launching a campaign on the streets to help end women's suffrage. Oddly, a lot of women were not familiar with the term women's suffrage, which led to some surprising answers. But if you thought that was bad, that was from about a decade ago. And just in 2016, another YouTube host repeated this prank leading up to the election. Listen to some similar results that he found when asking about ending women's suffrage on the streets. Taylor Swift and Katy Perry have set aside their differences. They were beefing for the longest time, and now they're they're working together to help end women's suffrage. Do, do you think, are you on board with that? You support, support the cause? Sure. No one, I mean, no one should suffer, so. The that's, women, especially, that's yeah, it. the women shouldn't have You're suffrage. You're making me suffer. I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Um, to Is end it, women's suffrage, yeah. absolutely. I would support it. I would go to that concert front row. Woo! Mrs. James, thank you so much for joining us in studio today. Clearly, there's a lot of confusion surrounding the term suffrage. We thought you'd be the perfect guest to break this down and share why we're talking about it now. Oh, my word. I don't even know where to begin on that one. You know, it would be funny if it were not so tragic. I think it speaks more to how we educate people in this country over the simple definition of a word suffrage, which simply, you know, refers to uh, the ability to vote in elections. It has nothing to do with suffering, um, (laughs) but it's sad to me that so many, I would say women, but probably all just don't understand the term suffrage. But it simply means the right to vote in an election. I'm glad we got that cleared up. (laughs) (laughs) So, Mrs. James, why are we talking about this now? Well, you know, I was so honored when President Trump asked me to be his representative to the uh, Women's Suffrage Commission. It was a commission that was established by Congress uh, to bring a bipartisan group of women together to plan uh, how we're going to educate. And Lord knows, based on what we just heard, we need to do a lot of that (laughs) and to celebrate Uh, women having the right to vote in our country. It will be the 100-year centennial, the the celebration year. Having joined that commission, I was honored that this bipartisan group asked if I would, in fact, chair this commission. Given the importance of this issue, the significance of it, what it means to me as an American and as a woman in this wonderful country, it is indeed an honor. And serving beside and along with some folks who I just admire and respect so much, your audience may know some of the names, Henny Nance from Concerned Women for America, or Marjorie Dannenfelser, who heads up that fabulous pro-life group, Cleta Mitchell, who is an attorney in our country, second to none, Uh, but also on the other side of the aisle as well. And I think she is an absolute icon, and every woman in this country ought to know Senator Mikulski and the incredible work that she has done in the uh, United States Senate as one of, if not the longest-serving woman in the United States Senate. 
And so she is the vice chair of the commission. And we considered it absolutely important to demonstrate to this country and to some of the guys in this town what it looks like when we come together as women across partisan lines to do something of great import and great significance. So I have learned a great deal from her. Uh, We have stormed the hill together and uh, are working side by side every day to make sure that if anyone repeats that little prank, that uh, (laughs) the women in this country will know what the women's suffrage movement is and some of the heroes that uh, paved the way for us to have the opportunity to vote. Before we get into the significance of this 100-year anniversary, I do want to mention the commission is composed of 14 members appointed by the president, as you were at the honor, um, the Speaker of the House, the Minority Leader of the House, the Majority Leader of the Senate, the Minority Leader of the Senate, the Librarian of Congress, uh, the Archivist of the United States, the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institute, and the Director of the National Park Service. So it really does feel feature a mix of different ideological perspectives. And in this time when our country is unfortunately so divided, do you think that it is possible that we could unite around the celebration of this monumental event? Not only can we, but we will. And our job is to encourage that kind of bipartisan work and support across the country. So we will be doing it at the national level and providing opportunities for people at the state level to celebrate as well. As each state ratified originally, we're hoping that those states will come on board with their own individual celebrations. And, you know, I forgot to mention a very important woman in all of this who is the executive director Uh, Rebecca Clayfish, and some of your listeners may remember her. She ran for uh, lieutenant governor in the state of Wisconsin with Scott Walker. She is giving of her time and talent now to chair this very important commission. So, Mrs. James, we'd love for you to walk back through history and share (laughs) what women today should know about the suffragettes and who are some of the most prominent ones that stick out to you. Well, first of all, they should know it was a very long and hard slog. And I think that's important to remember because today's young people sometimes think we should have instant gratification. But just to give you a few dates, a lot of people think that the real beginning happened in 1848 in Seneca Falls. And that's in New York. And it was the location of the first women's rights convention. And two uh, very important, well, one very important woman wrote the Declaration of Sentiments with the help of many of the women who were there at that convention. Elizabeth Stanton, I think the probably the next date of note was 1850 in Worcester, Massachusetts. It was the site of the first National Women's Rights Convention. And it was a stellar lineup of individuals who actually uh, participated there from Frederick Douglass, to Abby Kelly Foster, William Lord Garrison, uh, Sojourner Truth. It was a real strong alliance. And the I think it's also important to note that uh, the alliance between the abolitionist in this country and the suffragist uh, was so, so uh, important in making it happen. I didn't know that piece. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, of course, with the Civil War, things sort of died down a little bit as women turned their attention towards the war effort. 1866, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony uh, formed the American Equal Rights Association. Uh, it was an organization that was dedicated to the goal of suffrage for all, regardless of gender or race. However, uh, there was a little bit of an upset in the movement. Frederick Douglass, who had been such a great supporter and worked hand in hand with these two women, you know, we we think intersectionality is a new thing that, but but boy, you begin to see (laughs) this way back then in this battle because Frederick Douglass was so concerned that he thought that the, the leaders in the suffragist movement were taking resources from racist, and there was some um, uh, back and forth about whether and what should come first. Should women gain the right to vote first, or should blacks in America gain the right to vote first? And there was a little bit of conflict hmm. as they worked through some of those issues. 
But I think what's important for today, if we fast forward a little bit, is to recognize that when the Congress, the United States Congress, actually passed the uh, 19th Amendment and then the United States Senate, and then it went out to be ratified by the various states. And so it took a very long time for this to all unfold. And I think those of us who came through with the television uh, 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 where all problems were resolved in 30 minutes with time for commercials to recognize that sometimes it can take a very, very long time uh, to change the culture, to change the processes, and to, to really win the rights that, that uh, we so desperately want. And so what strategy did the suffragettes use to employ that change? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really interesting given the strategies that people use today, but they used everything. I heard they, something about a hunger strike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would like to think that I would have been tough enough to go along with the hunger strike, <laughs> but I'm not real sure. So they used a hunger strike. And, the, and there was tension about whether or not these should be national efforts or state by state, but... At the national level, they did picketing, they did demonstrations, they did hunger strikes, and women were determined to use the power that they had in the home to influence their husbands as well uh, to uh, get on board with uh, the, uh, the movement. Now, you may notice, and I think it's worthy of note, that, um, that I tend to use the term suffragist instead of suffragettes, and I don't know if you know that there is significance behind that. Uh, the suffragettes was a derogatory term that came out of England. And, you know, when you think about women's suffrage, they, they tried to demean women by saying, oh, you cute little suffragettes, aren't you, you know. So they wanted to minimize and demean, and it was a derogatory term. So American women tended to use and prefer the term suffragist. So we just have to be very careful with our language and make sure we don't use the derogatory term. I feel like I need to say that out loud. Suffragettes. Suffragettes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Tricky. Okay. So you did mention Susan B. Anthony earlier. Um, she's a very interesting figure to me because most people actually have heard of her name today because of the amazing pro-life group that the Heritage Foundation works with from time to time. So yes, yeah, Susan B. Anthony uh, is known as a pro-life figure today, but mm -hmm. she did play such an important role in leading this movement to get women the right to vote. Do you think that left-leaning women today have a difficult time reckoning with the fact that some of the most important women who fought and gained women's rights throughout history were actually, dare I say, pro-life? You know, I think it's a great lesson for them. And I only wish that we as women in uh, today's culture could come together around issues that are important across party and ideological lines. I see less of that. But I happen to know that there are women who are feminist, who are feel strongly about uh, women's rights, who are profoundly pro-life. And, uh, you know, there's even an organization called Feminist for Life. And that's so difficult for some on the left to wrap their heads around. But that's always been true. And I happen to believe, by the way, that to be pro-life is probably one of the most feminist positions you can take. Because I say that I refuse to change anything about who I am uh, to be equal to any man. I bear children, um, I, you know, and I don't need to change that or to mutilate my body or to do anything to be equal. And I think that's a very strong feminist position. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I have to say, I personally noticed what I've been calling a revisionist history when it comes to pro-life women's roles in securing women's rights throughout history, especially with conversations surrounding some of the abortion laws uh, that are circulating throughout the states right now. Um, I've seen a lot of women tell me that you can't be pro-life and be a feminist, and they constantly want to box us out of conversations, not just surrounding the life issue, but um, the Me Too issue, for example, uh, battling sexual assault and, and, and so forth. Um, and my question for you is, what more can we do as conservative women to make it known that not only do we want to be a part of the solution now, but we were a part of the solution throughout history. That's, right. That's exactly right. 
what more can we do? Um, I think as women, we have learned that one of the most empowering things we have are our voices, and we have to make sure that our voices are heard. I know many pro-life, conservative, evangelical, Republican women, you name it all, uh, who've had their own Me Too moments, and our voices need to be heard on that issue as well. I know many conservative women who have a lot to say about discrimination that they faced in the workforce. And I think it would be strategic and smart of the women on the left to understand that when they cut out our voices from the issues that are important to us, that what they're doing is missing an entire element that could help get these issues over the finish line. We have influence and voices, uh, and we can promote these issues as well. That's one of the things that I think is so significant and not to be overlooked about this particular commission. We have women on that commission from a broad, broad political perspective and who have differing opinions on many of the issues that are at the forefront of the political uh, debate today. But we have come together in solidarity on this issue. And uh, so we're really hoping that this particular commission can be a role model going forward of how we can come together uh, as Americans on issues that are important to us. Right. Sadly, that is so rare. So earlier this year, Google decided to create an advisory council that would help guide the company in the responsible development of artificial intelligence and asked you, Mrs. James, to join. After your involvement was announced, Google employees started a petition to have you removed from the panel because of your stance on some social issues. The employees were successful, Google removed you, and effectively silenced your voice due to political disagreement. Can you walk us through what happened? Well, sure. Uh, That was so unfortunate. Anyone who listens to what's going on in the news today know that we have some major issues with many of the social platforms. Um, And as conservatives, and we feel that our voices very often on those platforms are silenced, are are, um, rejected, um, or deleted. (laughs) And uh, so I thought it was significant that Google reached out and said, we'd like to hear your perspective as we deal with some of the complex issues surrounding artificial intelligence. And so I was shocked at the backlash from many of their employees. But, you know, we started the show talking about the ignorance surrounding just the term suffrage. And it occurs to me that in this particular issue with Google, there was so much ignorance because the employees, some 2,000 plus, who signed the petition that said, I should not be involved, had a caricature of who this person, Kay Coles James, is that bared no resemblance to reality. They just didn't do their homework. And probably my favorite characterization was when they, they called me a white nationalist. Well, a, you know, a slight, excuse me for saying this, but Google search would have turned <laughs> up that I am actually African-American and um, and I laughed about it and said, well, I'm glad I'm finally outed. I don't have to get up every day and put this black face <laughs> on. I mean, how silly can you possibly be? But the other terms were just as insulting and just as ill-informed, that I am anti-immigration. That says you do not really want to do your homework and understand what the real positions of conservatives are. To say that you're anti-gay I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous. And I think that they missed out on an opportunity to have conversation and dialogue with someone who may have a different perspective. And I didn't necessarily think they would end up agreeing with my perspective. But boy, could we have had interesting conversations and could we have understood each other better and perhaps reached consensus on some very important issues. Mrs. James, you handled it with such toughness, but also grace. And I think a lot of our listeners find themselves in similar positions, maybe not so high profile, but they might be the only conservative in their on their college campus, or maybe they're a young professional and they're the only conservative in their peer group. What is your advice to these young women? I would say, you know, one of the best gifts that we can give ourselves as women 
is to learn to be comfortable in our own skins. I am who I am. And um, one of the best pieces of advice that I got when I got to Washington is keep the group of people whose opinions you care about really small. My family, my husband, my friends, my church, you know, and, and as long as I stay true to who I am, all of the attacks that come just bounce off. Uh, when they were describing that person, it was humorous to me because I knew that just wasn't who I was. And so, you know, to be able to go to bed every night knowing that you are faithful to who you are, to your family, to your God, it puts you in a position of absolute confidence. And, you know, I think even biblically it talks about the peace that passes all understanding. I sleep really well at night unless my husband, my family, are upset over something, and I value their opinion so much that I want to have a conversation and straighten it out. Short of that, you can say almost anything you want, and it really doesn't matter. And I think that's one of the best gifts that we can give ourselves, to be confident in who we are. Yeah, absolutely. As someone in the media landscape, I um, take that advice to heart. And I, I think other women, you know, you don't have to be in the public sphere to really listen to that type of advice and not get worked up over somebody attacking you for your beliefs, which sadly is happening more and more today. But getting back to the reason we're having you on to the podcast today, um, we are very grateful that through this um, commission, you're having a very different experience mm -hmm. than you did with, with what happened over at Google. Um, so on August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment finally became part of the U.S. Constitution. It states the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Is that the end of the story? <laughs> <laughs> it never is the end of the story. You know, just because the 19th Amendment was passed didn't mean that, um, that you know, every state would ratify. It didn't mean that uh, there was still a lot in the culture that needed to, to change. Um, you know, there's always debates in political circles, which comes first, the cultural change, the political change, or does the political change drive the culture? And I don't think it's either or. I think it's both and. And so it was many years before men really let it sink into their souls that women had a right to be involved in the political process and express their views. So just because the 19th Amendment was passed, that was not the end of the story. There was a lot that needed to change in the culture. And I think, again, we, we so desperately want to see change happen and we want to see it happen quickly that we don't understand that sometimes it takes years and years and years and sometimes when we're involved in those kinds of struggles and debates uh, and battles, uh, we don't live to see it uh, fully come to fruition. So patience, patience, <laughs> patience. Okay, so we're about to take a break. But Mrs. James, can you let our listeners know how they can get involved on with the commission? Well, you can find us on the web. Uh, I dare say it again. <laughs> Google the Women's Commission, uh, Women's Suffrage Commission. It's actually called the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. And there they will find lots of helps and toolkits that give suggestions for what they can do at the state level and for what national uh, programs and projects they can get involved in. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You are truly an inspiration to all of us at Problematic Women. We're going to take a quick break, and then Kelsey and I have a few more headlines to go over. But stay tuned because Mrs. James will be back later in the show for a special surprise we have for her. Don't go far. Want to get up to speed about the Supreme Court? Then subscribe to SCOTUS 101, a podcast about everything that's happening at the Supreme Court and what the justices are up to. Has the hashtag MeToo movement made things harder for women in the workforce? According to CBS News, a new study by LeanIn.org found 60% of male managers said they are uncomfortable interacting with women at work, up 32% from 2018. Workplace interactions that men are nervous about include mentoring, socializing, and having one-on-one -on -one meetings. Sheryl Sandberg, founder of LeanIn.org and Facebook COO, proposed this solution. But if there's a man out there who doesn't want to have a work dinner with a woman, 
My message is simple. Don't have one with a man. Yeah. Group lunches for everyone. Make it explicit, make it thoughtful, make it equal. So, Kelsey, you found this article. You wrote about it in Bright on Wednesday. What do you think about Sandberg's proposal of only having group lunches? First off, I want to point out that we're a year and a half after the Me Too movement really took off, and we are still seeing repercussions of it. I think that is very problematic, if I can use that term. (laughs) Uh, It's something we need to talk about because this is a movement that was launched um, supposedly to empower women in the workplace and um, in their personal lives. And what we're finding in study after study is that it's doing the opposite in many ways. It is holding women back by making men scared to work with us. Um, So Sheryl Sandberg's solution that, um, you know, if you're a man who feels uncomfortable doing a work dinner with a female colleague, then you should not do a work dinner with a male colleague. And, you know, on one hand, I want to support it. But then I think there's plenty of things that I do in the workplace with my female colleagues that I wouldn't do with my male colleagues. And I think that's just you know, a a result of biological differences between men and women, how men and women interact and, and communicate differently. And we just form different types of relationships. We have different things to talk about with our male colleagues versus our female colleagues. So to create these bans on for for men to be able to go out with another male colleague for a work dinner, I think is really unnecessary. And it's like we're punishing them for the the bad behavior of a very small minority of men. Um, I think we need to focus on the bad apples rather than promoting blanket workplace norms that would punish men who have no who have not misbehaved in the workplace and have no reason to be forced into that type of punishment. And where's the line? You know, can you not? walk to the coffee machine with one of your colleagues? Can you not go to the corner store to get a soda in the middle of the day? It just seems like we're splitting hairs and we're making everything equal and we're bringing everybody down. And I think it's ignoring the fact that some women might not want to go to dinner with a male colleague and that's okay. That is our choice. I feel like a lot of the proposed solutions to Me Too are trying to protect women as if we're these fragile creatures that can't stand up for ourselves when it's really the opposite. (laughs) Like, I think what this movement needed to do was empower us to speak up when we're uncomfortable, when a male colleague invites us to dinner. And I want to be able to say, I don't feel comfortable going to dinner with you, but maybe before the Me Too movement, I was too scared to say that versus now, I feel that Um, women do have more of an ability to speak out. And that's maybe one of the good things that's come from the Me Too movement, that women are more empowered to stand up for themselves. But punishing all men for the bad behaviors of a few, I think, is the wrong path to go down. Did the statistics in the article surprise you that it's up 32 percent, up to 60 percent of total male managers now say that they're uncomfortable interacting with their female employees? Sadly, they didn't surprise me. I mean, did they surprise you? (laughs) No, I mean, I'm surprised it's not higher because you say one wrong thing, you can ruin somebody's career. Right. And men have seen that happen. And we have seen instances of false accusations. And so I don't I think it's difficult to blame men for feeling scared to enter these types of situations Because a simple perception can lead to an entire investigation and and maybe result in you losing your entire livelihood. And maybe you're the main provider for your household. So how can we blame men for wanting to protect themselves from facing any of these types of accusations? Because some of these accusations come from simply uh, misperceptions where maybe a, a woman thought a male was hitting on her. But really, he wasn't. And so in order to avoid that, men are just deciding, well, I'm not going to put myself in those situations where I'm going to be one on one with women in the workplace and mentoring them. And of course, that's going to hurt our careers. We need to be able to sit down with our male colleagues. We don't need to be able to be going to dinner with our male colleagues. But 
if we want to do that, we should be able to. And if we don't want to do that, we should be able to decline and not be punished for it. How do you think this Sandberg rule compares to the Mike Pence rule where Mike Pence doesn't have one on one meetings with his female colleagues and they'll bring someone else? Uh, That's an interesting question. And I did think of the Mike Pence situation. um, The totally sexist rule of Mike (laughs) Mike Pence. That was sarcasm, by the way. (laughs) I respect Mike Pence for his decision, and I'm sure his wife appreciates that. Um, You know, I I am married, and I like to know if my husband is going on a one-on-one dinner with another female colleague, I'd like to know why and everything about it, because for the most part, I do think one-on-one dinners with female colleagues are unnecessary, but there are plenty of situations where it would be completely innocent and and something does warrant it. I mean, if they're on a work trip together and you have no one else to get dinner <laughs> with, like, why wouldn't you get dinner with your opposite sex colleague? So, again, I think I'm just against creating these really rigid rules for men and women. I think we need to go back to common sense and standing up for ourselves. And I think on a case-by-case basis, it's okay for these male managers to set up rules, and it's about communication. So a woman doesn't feel like she's being singled out, and he's giving the reasoning behind it. Like, I don't believe that this is a situation that I'd be comfortable in. Instead, let's do this and propose a different solution. Right, and if as women we're allowed to say that I'm uncomfortable going to dinner with you, why aren't men allowed to say that? That's a great point, Kelsey. (laughs) (laughs) One thing, though, that bothered me about this article is that they assume that every workplace is male dominated and that every intera- every employee is a, is a every manager is a man and every employee is a female and in my experience in the professional world I've had so many great female directors and I feel we don't talk about that as much we don't talk about how can we be empowering women to more management roles if you listen to the whole Cheryl Sandberg interview one of her other solutions is to raise up and promote more women into higher up positions in the workplace and while that is laudable i would love to see more women in powerful positions i think that ignores the reality that women make different choices regarding their career they value flexibility they value taking time off when they have children um they aren't so much concerned about their salary as they are with being able to also raise kids. And I'm making sweeping generalizations here. There are plenty of women who don't value that and value their career first and make it to the top. But I think where Cheryl Sandberg is going with that scares me a little bit because it's suggesting that we should be hiring women for the sake of having more women Um, rather than hiring the best, most qualified employee. But I do agree with you. We're very blessed at the Heritage Foundation to have some great uh, female girl bosses. (laughs) (laughs) Not just saying that, to score brownie points with them right now. And I I think they set really good examples of being leaders. But I, I just, you know, men and women are different, and that's never going to change And trying to pretend that we're going to be perfect equals is just irrational. (laughs) And Kelsey, you and I have both on air talked about how we think the Me Too movement had a positive effect at the beginning. But now that we are a year and a half into the Me Too movement, do you think overall it's done more harm or overall it's helped women? I would say that this most recent study by Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In organization is Further evidence that no, the Me Too movement has not helped women. Um, I don't think it's helped women on paper. I do think it's helped women in in regard to what I was saying earlier, where women do feel more empowered to speak up. And when they face injustices, they're telling people about it. They are filing lawsuits and there are more support groups to assist them in those lawsuits. I saw there's one recently uh, against a a female employees um, filed a lawsuit against McDonald's. And it's great if if there are injustices happening to 
women who work at McDonald's who probably feel like they're in a very powerless situation, I think Me Too has done wonders for them to be able to stand up for themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's it's a complicated movement. I think we need to acknowledge the amount of damage that it's caused in terms of these studies that we now know men are literally scared so scared to have one-on-one meetings with us, they're not doing it. That can be very harmful to a woman's career. But we also need to acknowledge that um, women are more emboldened than they have been ever that I've seen in my lifetime to speak up and stand up for themselves. And I am encouraged by that. And I think it's like everything we advocate as conservatives is it's individual liberty. It's individuals need to be doing the right thing. And the more that we put one blanket policy all over everybody, the more that we're going to harm. Okay, Kelsey, last question. A lot of our listeners are young women either in college or recently entered the workforce. What advice would you give to those women that they are, they stand up for themselves, but they also are able to navigate in this Me Too world? I tell young women that it's likely throughout their career, they will face injustices in the workplace or outside of the workplace. But it's very rare that they will face inequalities and that women have equal protection under the law. And if anything happens to them, there's a legal system right there to support them. What they need to do is have the confidence to stand up for themselves and fight back when those injustices occur. But also, I encourage these women to be mindful of the difference between an injustice, and an inequality. Uh, We get very consumed with our own world here as women in the United States, and it's easy to forget how privileged we are to live in a country where we do have equality for the law. We have a justice system that's there to defend and support us, and there are millions of women um, who face not just injustices but actual inequalities worldwide And we should never take that for granted and do all we can to speak up and be voices for them. That was great advice, Kelsey. And one thing that I would also include to these young women is find a mentor who, a female mentor that you can go to and that will give you good advice. And you can ask them, hey, is this normal or is this something that I should, this is an actual injustice and I should be more concerned about? Okay, so with that, we're going to take a quick break, but stay tuned. When we're back, we're going to talk about the left's unhinged views on abortion. Liberals have pretty much cornered the market on 101-style podcasts that break down tough policy issues in the news. Until now. Did you know that every week, Heritage Explains intermingles personal stories, news clips, and facts from Heritage experts to help explain some of today's hardest issues from a conservative perspective? Look for Heritage Explains on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. In an interview with CNN outside of the Supreme Court, surrounded by Planned Parenthood protesters, Senator Gillibrand advocated for absolutely no limits on abortion. Americans, are, at least polling-wise, get a little uneasy about the fact that Democrats might be willing to leave it entirely up to people, put no restrictions on whatsoever. Do you, do you have any concern about that at all? I think the American people agree, uh, 70% agree that Roe v. Wade is settled law and that that fundamental decision of when a woman needs to make a decision about when she's having children, how many children she's having, under what circumstances she is having them, that those are fundamentally her decisions. If that wasn't radical enough, she went on to say that the taxpayer should foot the bill for these abortions. What about the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits federal funding for abortion, which you uh, oppose the Hyde Amendment? What would you say to taxpayers out there who say, look, I support everyone having their own freedoms, but that when it comes to my tax dollars, abortion isn't something that I want to support? You know, uh, we have a tenet in our Constitution. It's called separation of church and state. And uh, I do not believe that that is a valid argument. So every week we talk about abortion on the show, and that is not on purpose. It's just every week. The left says something crazier than they did the week before. (laughs) So, Kelsey, what do you think about Senator Gillibrand's remarks? Oh, my gosh. Where to start (laughs) with this? Uh, I'm going to start with the second clip uh, where Senator Gillibrand is talking about repealing the Hyde Amendment. 
Um, I just can't help but recognize how fast Democrats have turned from the party of being abortion should be safe, legal, and rare to not only should abortion be without restrictions to the point where a mother is literally in labor, but also you should pay for it. Even if abortion <laughs> is in uh, direct conflict with every fiber about your being, with your religious beliefs, with your moral beliefs, with your beliefs, uh, scientific beliefs about when life begins, now you should have to pay for it. It's it's cr- it's really crazy to see how far they've gone. Um, and I think this makes it deeply personal because we all pay taxes. And if you have to think about a penny of your tax dollars go to abortion, um, I mean, that's going to cause a major issue for a lot of Americans. Um, and the concept of our federal government compelling us to fund what really is murder is is like beyond something I ever thought I would see in my lifetime. And she as a senator takes an oath to the United States Constitution. And that's where the separation of church and state come from. But the separation of church and state does not mean that the American government can violate people's religious beliefs when they come in. It means that a church should not be elected as president. A church should not serve in the U.S. Congress. But so it's just crazy to me that this is her her defense. And it's not even saying that all people, taxpayers should be forced to pay for birth control. It's all taxpayers should be forced to pay for abortion at any point in the pregnancy. I just don't know how they can get more extreme. Kelsey, do you think this is a a good tactic for the Democrats and for Senator Gillibrand? Do you think the majority of Americans agree with her? Absolutely not. And it's really hard to square the Democrat position, which is becoming more and more mainstream on the left, which is abortion without restrictions all through nine months of pregnancy, with the fact that every poll tells us uh, that it is a very small minority of Americans who support that position. I looked up Gallup, which tracks abortion um, abortion opinions over years and years. And according to the most recent one, it's less than three in 10 Americans support abortion with no no restrictions. So with the vast majority of Americans supporting some sort of limits on abortion, it begs the question, who is Senator Gillibrand pandering towards um, and why is the Democrat Party turning so extreme on an issue where most Americans are far more moderate? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with money and fundraising. Um, Planned Parenthood is not just a innocent little nonprofit that uh, helps women get uh, health care as they like to brand themselves. Um, they have a whole massive action fund that donates thousands and thousands of dollars to different um, different politicians, almost all of them, to my knowledge, Democrats. And obviously, Planned Parenthood is going to the extreme on the issue of abortion. So I, I think a lot of it has to do with this more radical liberal base that does support these extreme positions that are just out of step with the vast majority of Americans. And I'm so glad you made that point about Planned Parenthood, because the United States government gives Planned Parenthood, what, five $500 million a year? And every dollar that the American government gives to Planned Parenthood is a dollar that they can, they, they can't spend that federal money on these action funds, but they can use the taxpayer money to finance everything else that they need to pay for. And it relieves, it relieves it relieves dollars. Money. So they and are, we all, all know money's fun, fungible. So when you give Planned Parenthood money for one procedure, it goes, it ends up subsidizing another, another procedure, procedure. And that procedure is obviously abortion in many cases. And she was literally standing there surrounded by women in pink shirts that say, I support Planned Parenthood. So if that wasn't crazy enough for you, actor Jim Carrey tweeted a very bizarre photo of Alabama Governor Kay Ivey being aborted in reaction to the pro-life bill she signed into law last week. We'll put the link to the tweet in the show notes, but if you haven't seen the image, uh, it's a sketch 
I believe Jim Carrey drew it himself. I haven't been able to. It, the signature's kind of chicken scratch, and I haven't been able to verify, but it looks like a J and a C. But it is a baby with the governor's head uh, in, in a womb, and there's a gloved hand holding a vacuum sucking out the governor's brain. The text on the tweet said, I think if you're going to terminate a pregnancy, it should be done sometime before the fetus becomes the governor of Alabama. As of right now, this tweet has almost 25,000 retweets and 118,000 likes. Because of the size of the baby and the instruments used in the picture, it seems to be a late-term dilation and extraction or DNX abortion. According to the American Life League, this is what happens in a DNX abortion used to kill babies up to 32 weeks old. Quote, the abortionist reaches into the mother's womb, grabs the baby's feet with a forceps and pulls the baby out of the mother, except for the head. The abortionist then jams a pair of scissors into the back of the baby's skull and spreads the scissors apart to make a hole in the baby's skull. The abortionist removes the scissors and sticks a suction tube into the skull to suck the baby's brain out. The forceps are then used to crush the baby's head and the abortionist pulls the baby's body out the rest of the way. So, Kelsey, this reminds me of Alyssa Milano's sex strike that we talked about last week. While she was advocating for abortion laws, it was actually promoting abstinence. Here he's trying to protest this abortion law, but he's actually showing how gruesome an abortion really is. I absolutely agree with you. I saw a lot of Twitter outrage when um, Jim Carrey first posted this picture. And when I saw the little tube and and the ratio of the size of the tube compared to the quote unquote womb where, you know, the body that was being aborted, it looked very real. Um, Because when you think about it, like if you put your hand in in a fist and then you put one finger out, you know, that's really what abortion is. It's, it's, it's using a tube to suck out the body of a baby um, forming that, reducing that child into liquid and, and sucking them out from a tube. It's really gruesome. And there's, you know, how people, all, all us kids these days say, oh, I, I can't unsee that um, when you see something like really gruesome. Um, I have to say, uh, when I saw Unplanned, it was my first time seeing an abortion on an ultrasound. And I, cannot unsee that image and it really is it was for me the tube sucking the life out of this body that just stuck with me I mean that's what abortion is and so when I saw this on Twitter part of me wanted to thank him for visualizing how gruesome this disgusting procedure is and I've always thought I've always always thought if more men and women saw what abortion is through an ultrasound, which very few people are willing to do. And I give Unplanned so much credit for putting that into the movie, as hard as that is to watch. Um, More people would have a difficult time defending it. So thanks, Jim Carrey. And for those who haven't seen Unplanned, uh, Kelsey, you saw the movie. It's the very first scene, correct? Yes, it's very early on. So if you don't want to watch it, you can be prepared and close your eyes. And, And there is a second scene later in the movie that isn't as visual but it, it's still pretty uh it's 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 still an abortion but it's that first scene that really stuck with me and what it is is it's the main character of the movie a real life woman abby johnson she was a director of a planned parenthood clinic and she was asked because everyone else in the clinic was busy to help with this uh ultrasound guided abortion and so you could actually see the tube coming in to harm the baby and the baby struggling and, and wanting to live yeah um so also, uh, while we're on this subject, last week, I don't know, Kelsey, on your Instagram feed, but on my Instagram feed, pretty much every person that I knew kept posting all these memes saying men shouldn't legislate women's bodies, and it showed all the men in the Alabama legislature who passed this. But I think it's super ironic because Kay Ivey was the one who actually signed the bill. Right. There's a lot of misinformation going viral on Instagram <laughs> last week and it still is and i'm glad you asked this and i think it's something we should plan to cover more on the show um this idea this this instagram activism that we've seen more and more of where people get on their moral high ground and um you know post these memes or or these these graphics on facebook 
um, you know, telling us their views on abortion and, and um, how wrong it is to oppose that. Um, I'm seeing it all over. Um, most, I feel like most of the big figures that I follow were posting about the six week bans that are spreading across a couple different states in the South. Um, this one girl that I follow in the yoga community, community, I've been, fo- I've been following her for a long time now. And I kind of always knew that she had these views, but it is so obnoxious and honestly painful to see them rubbed in your face on Instagram like that because Instagram, you know, I know Facebook likes to pretend they created these social networks to foster communications. It does not. On Instagram, if you are a celebrity with a big following, you are talking at people, not with them. And that's the problem, that when I see something that someone posts and I want to have a conversation with her about it and how my views are different and how I think, you know, the language she used wasn't, you know, I respect her. um, I I respect her ability to have her own positions, but I don't respect the language she used and the conclusion she's drawing about people who disagree with her. But um, you can't have those conversations. And I have never done this before, but... I actually sent her a couple direct messages pushing back on on the information she was spreading, the misinformation she was spreading. And of course, I didn't hear back. And of course, she'll, you know, repost some of the message messages she gets only from like the most extreme positions, not from, you know, someone like me who is really trying to have a conversation and have a civil conversation. So this is something that younger generations can't get away from their being infiltrated by it when they're on social media. And I do tend to think that people on the left are way more likely to use this form of Instagram activism than people on the right are. Um, A lot of us just know it's not a productive way to facilitate a conversation. And so we stay away from it. But that doesn't mean it stays away from us. And it can be very disheartening, um, difficult to deal with. And I've heard from a lot of conservatives in the past two weeks that they're struggling with how many people they looked up to are shoving this stuff in their face. It's, it's for me, it's frustrating and it, it disheartening is a good word for it to see. I think with celebrities have kind of been like, Oh, whatever, we're not going to change it. But my <laughs> friends, the people that I care about and they're, it's just misinformation. So Kelsey, final question is, what do you recommend when you, when you're seeing your friends post all everything wrong How do you have that conversation? How do you make it productive and not just arguing on the Internet? Instead of commenting publicly where everyone else can see it and sort of instigating a fight or engaging in a fight, I would take the time to send them a direct message and say, hey, I know you have really strong opinions on this and I respect that, but I know a lot of women who disagree and I would love to have a civil conversation with you about it next time I see you. Um, and just to show that (laughs) in a way we're taking the high ground that we're not afraid to have this conversation. That's not why we're being quiet on Instagram. It's because we know nothing productive is happening there. You're not changing anyone's minds. You're actually forcing people more into their corners because on both sides, you just get frustrated when you see something you don't agree with versus when you're sitting down face to face and have a conversation with someone at some point in that, you're going to be able to find a common ground. And there was some good news in there, at least for me. A very liberal friend of mine from college posted on Facebook a screenshot of a pro-life Allie Beth Stuckey tweet. And I saw that and I put the praise hand emojis in the comments. <laughs> she is um, a great follow on Instagram. Um, she's someone who has been commenting and trying to help women who are feeling frustrated by the influx of um, abortion active Instagram activists on um, on on social media. So I highly encourage you all to go listen to her podcast and give her a follow on Instagram if you're feeling disheartened by what you're been, you've been seeing lately. All right, with that, we're going to take another short break. But when we come back, we're going to have Mrs. James back in the studio and together crown our Problematic Woman of the Week. Looking for a short morning podcast to give you the news of the day without liberal bias? The Daily Signal podcast is a rundown of the top stories you need to know that the mainstream media is probably ignoring.
Welcome back, Mrs. James. On each episode of Problematic Women, we spend the last segment honoring a right-minded woman or group of women who take a stand for individual freedom and the values this country was founded on, even if sometimes that stance is difficult. Kelsey, why don't you do the honors? So this week's Problematic Woman of the Week, of course, has to go to Mrs. James oh and the whole <laughs> Women's Commission, um, because we know that every woman on this panel that you are uh, working on has very busy schedules, and you all are making personal sacrifices and working extra hard to make it work and celebrate this really important uh, event that we clearly need uh. to do more education on. So we wanted to let you know how much uh, we at Problematic Women and all our listeners appreciate appreciate all the hard work that you and the commission are doing. Well, if your <laughs> listeners could see, I'm a little teary-eyed oh. here and grateful for that <laughs> honor. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our show today. But Mrs. James, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. I hope you come back soon. Well, thank you. And I always will come back when you ask. <laughs> <laughs> Join us next Thursday morning for our brand new edition of Problematic Women. And in the meantime, please subscribe and share. Conservatives need your support in the podcast world, and we would greatly appreciate a five-star review on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. It really does make a difference. Have a great week. This podcast was created by The Daily Signal, produced by Kelsey Bowler and Lauren Evans, edited by Michael Gooden and Thalia Rampersad. Special thanks to The Daily Signal's editor-in-chief, Katrina Trinko. We produce Problematic Women, in remembrance of our dear friend and former co-host, Bree Payton. <laughs>